He's from Los Banos, and he's going to talk about these. Sure. Good morning. I will try not to uh, belabor this, because I know it's been a warm morning standing out in the sun. But um, I guess I'll just hold this. Um, I'm a beekeeper. Been it's easier to hold it. Yeah, you know, it on. Get flip it off, please. I appreciate it. David Chang. I'll get away from that yeah. unit over there. Yeah, I uh, I first moved bees to Amazon, 1969. I was a high school student, and the beekeeper I was working for got five bucks a hive. Um, put them in the orchard, especially you buy a hive for ten. And uh, queens were only a dollar. Uh, today they're 21, so uh, everything goes up. But uh, certainly, um, bee pollination is a very important part of your program and of, of your business. And um, beekeepers such as myself, my son and I run a couple thousand colonies uh, when they're all alive. And right now they're not quite all alive, but we're getting there. But we also lease bees from out of state. We get bees from New England, bees from the Midwest that we rent out to some of our growers that we just don't have enough. You know, many of you may not know it, but it takes nearly 90% of the available managed commercial honeybees in the entire USA to pollinate this valley damage every year. If you take the 2.6 million colonies that the USDA estimates that we have in this country during the peak season, deduct the winter losses that we've been incur uh, incurring, which last year was 31%, uh, you can end up with about 1.8 million. We need about 1.6 million, actually a little bit more than that, to pollinate the over 800,000 acres of animals in this valley. So you are getting the majority of the nation's beehives, and consequently, the majority of the nation's beehive health is in your hands. And I'm going to talk about that today. And we're dealing with, with things in our level with nutrition, with mites, with diseases, and of course with pesticide exposure. And that's, that's something that uh, uh, the animal growers I work with are all very cognizant of, and I'm sure you are too. But there's some things that are happening, and they've been happening more and more in recent years that are concerning for us and I think that they should be a concern for you as well uh, because what happens during almonds not only affects the bees at that time but it can affect the viability of the colony and the ability of that colony to overwinter successfully and be here for you next year. So I'm going to be addressing some of that. And some of these things are not, some of these products that we're talking about are, uh, oh boy they're good. I think we'll just hold it. Some of these products are not toxic to adult bees. And the Environmental Protection Agency evaluates products on their toxicity to adult bees and not so much on other negative effects on the colony, which up to now have been uh, deemed to be sublethal. But if the colony has negative effects, certainly um, it's, going to, it's going to affect the ability uh, to have enough adult bees to pollinate whatever crop uh, you may have or uh, for the beehive to maintain its, its healthy status. Pardon me for my notes. You know, some of these products that uh, I'd like to talk about today are the, the fungicides and insect growth regulators that uh, that are used during almonds. And um, as you probably know, there are no bee hazard warnings on the label of these products whatsoever. Um, and whether they're used individually or whether they're tank mixed together and um, resulting in some synergism in some cases, um, there definitely are effects. And, and it's something that, that we need to look at. I mean, we've as beekeepers, we've seen this and um, I know it's, uh, it's preferred to use such products. I, I can recall the days of parathyroid and oil dormant, diazinon and oil, 
Amadan and Oil, Superslide, whatever you name the product. And I know that the, uh, the industry has been moving toward these more um, sustainable efforts, if you will. And, uh, and I can appreciate that that, that is something that uh, has been viewed up until recently as a benefit. And I'm just here to tell you that there are downsides to that. And, but I, I think there are remedies to it. I think there are ways that they can be applied, um, either individually, uh, and, and timing of sprays, the amount of water and whatnot, that, uh, that can make these products less of a detriment to the bee colonies. One of the problems that we've had relates back to the label and the fact that there are no bee hazard warnings on any of these products. And how is a grower or a PCA supposed to know whether or not there are potential problems with the product because there's nothing on the label? And um, we've talked to some folks at EPA about this, and uh, there's nothing that is going to be done prior to this next season's almond bloom. So with educational forums like this and with the almond board's uh, work, and Danielle is here from the almond board today, has some very good uh, handouts that uh, you're encouraged to take home with you, uh, trying to educate uh, the industry as to these potential problems. Uh, potential, they're real problems in, in some cases. Let me just explain to you a little bit about the brood cycle in a bee colony. The queen bee is the heart of that colony, and during the springtime she's laying 1,000 to 1,500 eggs a day. And as the day length increases, as a general rule, the egg laying rate increases as well. So right now we are probably during that maximum time period where a good queen, assuming she has enough room to lay uh, and enough uh, food stores, or forage coming in to feed the developing brood. Uh, we're at maximum brood production right now. But that really begins in January and goes on through uh, almond pollination. And um, from egg to hatch, it takes 21 days for a worker bee uh, to, to fully develop and hatch out. Uh, some of these products, uh, some fungicides alone will uh, inhibit the uh, microbiome in a bee colony from um, converting pollen into what we call bee bread. It's basically fermented pollen. And that is how the bees uh, can, can utilize pollen. Uh, pollen is their only protein source. And uh, if, if the brood is to be fed properly, uh, the pollen must be converted to bee bread. And some products inhibit this. Uh, the insect growth regulators will stop the development of uh, the bee. And uh, oftentimes we'll see pupae that are ready to hatch and they die in the cell. Uh, we will see uh, dead bees in front of the colony, but the dead bees in front of the colony are young fuzzy bees, either newly hatched or pulled from the cell by other bees uh, because they were dead. So this is distinctly different from a pesticide kill where you see dead adult bees, the old shiny ones, if you will, uh, in front of the colony entrance. Uh, if you see young fuzzy bees, a lot of times we'll see this when they're moving out of the almonds. We'll have a truck bed full of uh, dead fuzzy bees. And uh, that indicates that there was some sort of brood damage you know, during the uh, bloom usually occurs about 12 to 14 days after the exposure. So obviously good, clean pollen, nectar, water are important for a healthy bee colony. And speaking of water, boy, this year was tough. You know, never had a year quite like this. We've had dry years before, but boy, a lot of places there was just no water for the bees to drink. And that's something that's very critical. If you as a grower can make sure that there is 
some source of clean, uncontaminated water for your bees, uh, that's extremely important. They need to drink like we do. They need it not only for their bodily functions, but they need it uh, to cool the hive. On a warm day, they want a swamp cooler where uh, they deposit water droplets within the hive, fan the wings, and, and uh, keep it cool enough uh, for, their, for their needs. We had a meeting in Las Venus uh, about a month ago. There, let me back up a little bit. There was a beekeeper from Arizona who had some bees in Kern County that got some significant damage um, from some of the fungicide IGR applications down there. And he, he's on the EPA's Pesticide Program Dialogue Committee, and he called a couple of guys back there and said, you got to come out to the valley and see this. And, and uh, so a couple of guys came out, and they came right to Las Banas and came to my brother's place. And my brother's also in the business. He's, he runs, like I say, I run a couple thousand colonies, but he runs about 6,000, and he's also an animal grower. And uh, uh, anyways, they came out to uh, my brother's place, and... We had 32 beekeepers that showed up. This is a very impromptu thing. We had about two days' notice. But uh, those 32 beekeepers, uh, in an informal survey that we did there, said that they had nearly 70,000 colonies that they felt were negatively affected by these products this year. And of those nearly 70,000, about three-quarters of them were considered to be severe damage. Uh, we also had a teleconference set up and uh, another 10,000 or so colonies with severe damage were, were mentioned uh, by beekeepers that were on the phone. So it's something that's significant. It's just a sampling of some beekeepers, it's certainly not the entire industry, but it shows that there's a significant issue here. And uh, like with my brother, his damage was, well, he had two different areas where he had damage. One was a fungicide alone, but it was applied with only 25 gallons of water. And my brother strongly believes that when you use a low volume of water like that, even though you've got the same amount of active ingredient per acre, that somehow it makes it tougher on the bee. This was applied at night, by the way. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and the other one was a, was a fungicide insect growth regulator uh, tank mix. But uh, the beekeepers, who were at the meeting, but many of them were from out of state. And uh, obviously with needing 1.6 million colonies, the majority of our bees for this valley, for almond pollination, come from out of state. Between 1.1 and 1.2 million uh, are from outside of California. But some of these beekeepers, especially the ones from the south, indicated that they're not sure if they're coming back. And uh, the guys in the south, especially in the South Texas area that can make a honey crop during the time when almonds bloom. And we're getting over two bucks a pound for honey right now. It's the highest price for honey we've ever had. They have a legitimate claim that they could stay home, make honey, uh, have less expense, and have healthier bees in March and April. And uh, they're serious about maybe not coming back. So we need to address the situation because as I mentioned earlier, we're right on the edge of using most of the bees in the country anyway. So it's something that we, we do need to uh, address. I mentioned night spring, and uh, the Almond Board uh, and others, uh, university folks, have been recommending night spraying. If you need to spray during bloom, at all, don't, don't do it, especially don't do it in the morning, because when the anthers dehiss pollen, the uh, individual anthers dehiss pollen once, and it's there in the morning, and your bees are out collecting that pollen and distributing it in the morning, and so it's really not a good idea if you want to encourage pollination to be out there spraying anything in the morning. Uh, the recommendations are that you start spraying later in the day, start spraying four or five o'clock, depending on the day, uh, and go on into the evening, but probably stop like about midnight or one. Some of the beekeepers who had severe problems 
uh, who reported severe problems at this meeting in Los Banas last month, said that their growers were applying at night. They were trying their best to avoid problems with these materials. But some of them were like starting at midnight and finishing at five in the morning. And we really don't know, and it's probably temperature, humidity dependent, but we don't know what time of the morning the answer is actually to hiss. So if they're hissing like at three in the morning, well then that pollen is gonna be contaminated with the product. So we're kind of thinking, and, and we need some more scientific research done on this, but we're thinking that the late afternoon to maybe midnight or one in the morning application would probably be less of a hazard to the bee colonies than a midnight to five in the morning. So you got night versus night, and I, we're thinking earlier the better. Um, and the amount of water that you use. Again, my, uh, my brother and some of the other beekeepers mentioned that, that some growers were using as little as 25 gallons uh, of water per acre, and that does seem to be a factor. The less water you use, the more potential problems there will be um, to the bees. Uh, we had a fellow there, a good friend of mine, who works for Paramount Farming. And as you know, they're the largest animal growers in the world. And uh, they make a conscious effort to not spray anything during bloom. And except for 160 acres where they had an anthrax nose issue, and they applied a fungicide only at night, and there was no problems for the bees, uh, they, they didn't spray anything this year either during bloom. But they have a, a very good sanitation program. They, uh, they conscientiously uh, get rid of every last mummy, so they say. And uh, so they, they, they make an effort. And they didn't do this initially because they wanted to help save bees. They did this because they noticed many years ago that their yields were being reduced when they did that. And what they found, and, and the Almond Board's funding a study right now, um, to verify this, what they found was that um, any flower that was not pollinated, uh, once it once that stigma was hit with the fungicide, it would not ever be pollinated. So um, anyway, the Almond Board's funding a study right now to verify this, but, but uh, uh, that's interesting that the largest almond grower in the world, granted they have some ground in Kern County, they've also got ground right out here in uh, Madera County, just east of Fireball. So, um, uh, they're not all in Kern County. Of course, their neighbors in Kern County will spray during bloom. Some of Paramount's bees had some severe root damage this year from neighbors who applied fungicides and IGRs. So anyway, uh, oh, another thing. Got a booklet here. This booklet here is Pacific Northwest number five. 91, and uh, only on one copy here, sorry. Uh, but uh, this can be downloaded from the Oregon State website. Or they can uh, contact us because we have it, we send it out to all of our growers. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Hey, this is, it's not perfect, but it's as good as we got right now. And it's way better than the last University of California publication that was published in 1981. So uh, there are, uh, the majority of the materials that you could possibly use are listed here. And they're listed uh, according to toxicity as determined by the label. Uh, there's a red column, which is highly toxic, yellow column, which is moderately toxic to bees, and a green column, which indicates that this product has no uh, bee warning on the label. However, given what I mentioned earlier, that we know that there's, there are some problems in the colonies with certain products, and certainly with certain tank mixes of products. Um, there are some question marks next to the X's in the green column on some of these products where, where problems have been reported. So, uh, uh, and there are some products that we've been exposed to that have supposedly caused damage this year according to uh, a lot of beekeepers that have no question mark by the X. So just because there is no X by the, or no question mark by the X does not mean that there may not be a problem, especially if the product is tank mixed. So anyway, uh, please uh, pick up the almond board information uh, regarding the recommendations of not spraying uh, during the day, uh, at least when pollen is still shedding and the bees are active. Because you know, you can drive through your orchard 
with just plain water coming out of your sprayer, and you're going to disrupt pollination for a good part of that day, maybe all day. And uh, uh, when bees get hit with spray droplets, uh, especially if the weather is cooler, they're going to get knocked to the ground, or, and they may chill and not make it back to the hive. So you're paying good money for bees to pollinate your crop. So just try to maintain a good environment as you possibly can to uh, allow them to do that job. So I'd certainly like to entertain any questions you may have. I guess the question maybe go back to David Dahl. Sure. If, if one is, if you try to alleviate that, then it's probably a little more important to put a dormant spray on with a little copper prior to bloom. Really as one of the things all of that in the information. Share with that how effective putting copper in a dormant spray if you're trying to alleviate sprays during the fungicide spray. I, sure. think, I think they have him captured. Tied the, the TV guys do. No, he's, he's back, back here by the John Deere. Oh, there he is. There oh, okay. There's our David question. No, so that's a good question because you've got to, you're going to treat it somewhat. So it's a matter of better off wind. Better that, put a dormant spray on the copper. <laughs> Ask again, Frank. Um, looking at fungicide sprays during bloom and pollination, try to alleviate bee damage. Are we better off to put a dormant spray on to get some copper in the field prior to bloom? So if we have to kind of string it out and keep them, yeah. Where do we draw the line as far as what's the lesser of three evils? You know, my my attitude is I, I think a lot of times we make. Uh, bloom sprays when we don't need to make bloom sprays. We still don't make bloom sprays if we're predicting rain or, or really high dew periods. Because you need free moisture for a disease. These disease just doesn't occur. Uh, I think where you'll benefit out of the copper spray, so to answer your question directly, the copper spray will help with scab. Um, you won't get much suppression of ground rot and those bloom time diseases. The other thing to keep in mind when you talk about bloom sprays is your varietal susceptibility. So like you, you always have to spray view and I, I, at least, I should say least, uh, I should say always, but you have to spray view a lot more than other varieties because of sensitivity, but non prowl I know guys that have not ever sprayed their non prowl and always had a reasonable prowl. Uh, so I guess that's kind of my attitude, is it, it should be dependent upon the weather and, and the history of disease. You say weather and rain, but not, but it depends on temperature and rain? Uh, the temperature inversions can cause humidity, so yes, um, and humidity means dew, and, and dew is free moisture which causes disease, so that's kind of where that runs into play. But yeah, you need you need leaf wetness, or you need actual free moisture to, for disease. Yeah. More questions, or? Yeah. yeah. On a dry year like this, you're not going to want to put on a dormant spray, your trees are dry. Right. Yeah, but you're supposed to wait till these go out in March. Have, have you seen oil dam oil oil worm damage? I've heard about it. And I don't want to try it. I've the mm -hmm. only time I've ever seen oil burn damage is uh, oil that included a penetrant with 415 that went on after post harvest when the trees were dry. And I I think we're I mean I, I don't. With the, we, we are now spraying 415 oils in the winter time. We used to use 470s, and the purity is much higher. I, I think the risk of burn is much less than we're giving it credit for. And, and I mean, I, I, I think it's, you do have to weigh it, but if you had any rainfall or any type of uh, post, -harvest irriga or post harvest irrigation, there's probably a lot more moisture in the ground than what we get credit for. Right. Right. I mean, I know PCAs don't want to be on the, the call when they get burned, but. Has anybody seen burn damage? Oil burn? We just backed off our oil this year, not knowing. So we just threw two gallons of oil instead of just six, and it's backed off. Yeah, you know. Yeah, has anybody? I mean, I'll stand to be proven wrong. I mean, but how long ago? It's been a long time. The, the oils now are so refined and safe, uh, uh, you just don't see it very often. And you, you might see it in the middle of the winter, cold, dry conditions. You might see some uh, wood damage. Yeah. That uh, in season foliage at moderate rates. No and, damage. And I mean, what I saw, it was ugly. I mean, I know we want to prevent it. I agree with you, but I just. I don't, don't want to be the guinea pig. Yeah, I know. I know. Nobody does. But I asked this question the past couple of years if anybody's seen it. And I think there's a private consultant up north who actually went and sprayed a bunch of trees at a lot of high rates. 
So hopefully we'll, we'll have more of a definitive answer for you. Um, but I, I think it's there's a lot of fear, and I don't know if the fear is is as, yeah. I, I don't. If you're talking about oil, insecticide oil. And dormant. And dormant. Boy, moments I just and unless it's been real frozen condition. Uh, I think Eric's right on this with the refined oils that we've got now. Actually. If I were farming, I'd be using them a lot more as a mic preventative uh, when I'm going through. I mean, you know, you've got all the compatibility issues, so that's something that I, I can't speak broadly on in terms of compatibility. In grapes, it's a real issue. Uh, because it's, it's yeah. an issue too. But um, in almonds, 1%, 2% oils are pretty darn safe. Particularly the 415s, they'll classify them. The, the, a 415 is considered a very lightweight oil, and it's uh, based on I think what they, they run it through a time filter, and uh, 415 um, will fill evaporates 50 percent at 415 degrees to fill a certain uh, jar. A 440. That 50% occurs at 440 degrees. And then a 470, which the old vote was, that's a true dormant, would, have, would uh, evaporate 50% at 470 degrees. I think that's right. Roy, help me on this if I'm, if I'm off. It's the distillation temperature, I think. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's the word. Yeah. The that's distillation true. temperature. And so the 415s are pretty safe, uh, even, even in great my, my uh, leaf so. Well, I know there was a there was a, a person I worked with on their spray program, and they put in 415 at one percent every spray they went through last year, and they they got burned at the end of the year, but it was the last spray, and it's because they used a product that had more of a penetrating oil, so they sprayed more like a four percent oil solution on dry yeah. trees. Yeah. And I, you know, that's. It's a lot of oil, but one percent I don't I think in season any time as long as it's compatible with what you're putting on. You know. I uh, I talked to Steve here, so he won't back this up. But uh, when I was still back in, in Steve there, where are you? Uh, he's over there. He won't hear me. Uh, when I was still in Kern, we were doing this mite movement study, and I was trying to spray the lower half of the tree. I used a bunch of uh, different materials, but one I actually did, and it was illegal, but it was on a test plot, was uh, lime sulfur. You went the 10 gallon rate with the 1% oil. You got a little bit of tip burn, and this was in 90 degree, it was just like this. It was this kind of weather. 90 degree, we had a little bit of tip burn, and that's all we had on those. Now, that's something I really not recommend. Walt is not recommending this, <laughs> but that. That lime sulfur did, and, and that combination kept mites off those trees the remainder of the year. So, Walt is not recommending that you do. <laughs> what what oh, Walt and Dave? Only think. professional. <laughs> what do you think about the one percent solution of 415 oil up to a certain point in the year? Then I think that's good. Yeah, I think that's good. And and they were mixing in. Um, well, Roy's here, so he can comment on this. But they were mixing. <laughs> 1% uh, oil with potassium nitrate and requiem, which is, it's, uh, an, oil it's, it's an oil, and they're going a real high rate of, of requiem, and, and that last spray where they used it on dry trees, so they're spraying 3% oil solution on dry trees, and that's when they got the burn. So 1% oil, all the way up, they sprayed it in May, they sprayed it in June, they sprayed it in July, and then they sprayed it in post-harvest. So you're using potassium nitrate also just to try to help. And they no didn't get. With 1% oil. They didn't, and they're, and this is on the west side, so this is hot temperatures. You know, these guys were spraying a lot of oil, and and all the way through the season, 3% oil solution. But once the trees got dry at 3%, it sucked it in. So, yeah. but I think at 1%, yeah. they would have been fine. Um, I don't, I don't know if I go past hole split with that kind of stuff, but at this time of year, uh, those really nice oils they've got now. You know, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, too high is bad, but I don't know. I mean. Thank you.